First of all, Mr. McNarim, thank you very much, Osama. Thank you very much for participating. What's important about this lecture is to introduce to the students uh, a new way of thinking of politics. One that is going to be debated, it's going to be discussed, but let's discuss and debate uh, with, with respect and with one another. And let's allow it, but let's also know when to stop. It's part of him. And we want to discuss, but we want to discuss for the proper end, which is the betterment of our politics, the betterment of our CSA. So what this discussion was aiming for was to introduce the uh, discussion of ikhlaq and CSA. And that's, uh, I hope, that the students could gain from that and to move away from uh, tidbits of information or, or, or little snippets of misinformation that try to equate uh, politics as something separate and Islam as something separate. That shows, really for me, a lack of understanding the entire complexity of Muslim society. Um, yet, I would claim here at the beginning of this talk that Islam and Muslims could contribute to a new definition of politics uh, that has ethics at its core. And I know that sounds very strange, but hopefully we are able to do that. Uh, before we as Muslims offer a new definition of politics in which ethics is at the center, I think we need to work on ourselves first, and we need to answer some questions in our Islamic heritage that actually, in my view, hinders us from doing this, from offering something new and ethical in the world of politics. Um, in our history, uh, in the history of Islamic thought and Islamic law, there is a separation in the field of ethics uh, and in the field of politics between al-fiqh and al-akhlaq. Um, in general, and especially in politics, in general there is a separation between fiqh and akhlaq. You study fiqh, you study al-ahkam al-amaliyya min adilat al-tafsiriya, you study the, the practical rules that are derived from the scripts based on the linguistic implications. Uh, if you study ethics, akhlaq, you study virtues. Uh, you know, shaja'a wal karam wal rahma wa al haqq you study, you know, courage and mercy and love of truth and all. You study virtues, really. And you don't have um, a direct theoretical relationship in the usul, in the fundamental theory of the Islamic law. You don't have this direct um, connection between the ethics and the, the virtues, in that sense, and the, role, and, and the law and the rules. In politics, it's even more evident. Because in politics, in our Islamic heritage, we have fiqh siyasa shar'iyya, which is the shar'i law of politics, or the sharia-based uh, political rules. That is on one hand. And on the other hand, we still have virtue ethics, or ilm al-akhlaq, that is a very different field. And when you study fiqh siyasa shar'iyya, again, it is ahkam. It is rules that are derived from the script with not much mention of ethics or values that affect the derivation of these rules from the script. And therefore, we have this schism in our mentality when we think about politics from an Islamic point of view. We have a separation between the ahkam or the rules that govern what is right and what is wrong in politics, and the virtues that are in a separate field and are not theoretically or practically linked to the ahkam in our history. If you look at uh, ahkam al-Sultaniya, ahkam al muluk and all of these books that talked about the rules that govern uh, the khilafah or govern the politics uh, in the siyasa sharia, in the you know, sharia-based politics, you find that, uh, that these rules are derived from specific actions and sayings of the Prophet and verses from the Qur'an 
that are um, claimed to have um, the only rules that are needed. So basically, for example, you find long debates on whether shura consultation is mu'lima or mulzima, whether the shura is um, abiding to the ruler or it's not abiding to the ruler. Whether the ruler, after he makes a, a shura, he has to go by it or that he does not have to go by it. And you find the debates based on the linguistic evidence, on the dilalat al um, whether, you know, what happened when the Prophet وسلم, asked the companions uh, about something, did he go by their shura? Yes, he did. But did he do that all the time? Or sometimes he didn't. Um, and then you have somebody quoting Abu Bakr anhu, when he asked for the shura before the Hurub al-Riddat, and then he waged the war anyway. And then people are going back to the history as a reference for what is right and what is wrong in politics, in the issue of Ashura. Um, another example, Al-Aimmatul in Quraysh, Prophet Sallallahu in a hadith, he says, Imams are from Quraysh. So you find this long debate on whether the Khalifa or, or the Wali or whatever should be from Quraysh, uh, Khalifa specifically, and, and whether this hadith is right or wrong, and who are the narrators, and how uh, the hadith, and so forth. Um, and you find that fiqh siyasa sharia is, um, with all due respect, void of ethics. Because it is really about the implications of specific verses and specific traditions, and how they affect the rules. But the fundamental uh, introductory chapter in any of these books is not ethics, is not here are the fundamental principles upon which a siyasa or politics in Islam is based. It is mostly about derivations from the scripts. Are derivations from the scripts wrong? Uh, am I calling for some secular approach to politics? No. But I'm calling for a derivation from the script that focuses on the ethics rather than the rules. Because the rules are not meant, in, in the issue of, of politics, are not meant to be eternal. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ was a prophet, a messenger, and he was a leader at the same time. But scholars differentiated between his capacity as a prophet and his capacity as a leader. And that is very important for us as students of politics to understand. Um, if you read, for example, Al-Qarafi, Al-Qarafi, one of the Maliki Imams, one of the major Imams of, of all time, um, he has a book by the name Differences, or al furuq One of the differences he's making in his book, he's saying there is a difference between the Prophet's actions as a messenger and the Prophet's actions as a politician. فَرْقُمْ بَيْنَ تَصَرُّفِهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمَ بِالْتَبْلِيغِ وَتَصَرُّفِهِ بِالْإِمَامَةِ What does this mean? He is saying that when there is, there is a difference between the Prophet's tradition, the Prophet's sunnah, as a prophet, a messenger who is teaching us how to worship uh, Allah and how to conduct our lives as individuals and as families in the society. And on the other hand, the prophet as a politician, because the prophet as a politician, as a leader, وسلم, his sunnah is correct and is going by the principles and everything, but it is not necessarily abiding to us in every place and time. Because he made decisions based on a number of values and a number of ethical virtues. These ethical virtues are abiding, but the decisions themselves are not abiding. Because the decisions themselves are subject to place and time. And that is how you can have ethical politics today. Because if you take the fundamental values upon which the Prophet ﷺ based his politics, then you have ethical politics. But if you take the letter of what he did, وسلم, what he did might not be compatible with our time. It is not wrong. It's not about right and wrong. It's about compatible with the time based on the values or not compatible with the time based on the values. And let me give you examples just in case this is an, an abstract concept here. 
the Prophet sallallahu uh, for example, uh, took a jizya from the people of the book in the conquered lands. So therefore, uh, when a certain land became under the Islamic rule, the people of the book were supposed to pay, to pay a tax, a non-Muslim tax, because they were non-Muslims. Now, if you look at this uh, as a hukm, as a rule, as a shari'i rule, as it is in the fiqh siyasa shari'i, then it is something that has to be done in every place and time. In every place and time, under Muslim rules, non-Muslims have to pay a jizya. But if you look at it in terms of the value that the Prophet ﷺ was keeping, then the value stays and the rule changes. What is the value? The value was justice in, in a number of senses. One of them is that these people were paying for their security because they were not taking part of the Muslim army at that time. The army was made out of Muslims, did not accept the Muslims at that time. For the politics of the time, the army is made of Muslims and protecting Muslims and non-Muslims. Non-Muslims were a part of the society that is paying for its security, for the army to protect it. Non-Muslims at that time were not paying zakat to the state, but Muslims were paying zakat to the state, were paying charity. And therefore, at that time, the state would collect zakat from, non -Muslims, from Muslims, but does not collect zakat from non-Muslims. So therefore, the politics of the time based on the principle of justice, dictated that non-Muslims pay something to the state in lieu for all, all of their security and of the charity that Muslims pay, on the other hand. So this, if you look at it in a historical perspective, that is something that is fair and just. If you look at it in today's state, that is something that is not fair and not just. Why? Because the state of today with multi-religious citizens, um, Qatar is, is all Muslim, but if you look at Egypt, if you look at Morocco, at Lebanon, countries that are Islamic countries, but they have major minorities of non-Muslim faith. Now, if you want these people to pay taxes just because they are Copts in Egypt, or they are Jews in Morocco, or they are whatever, Christians in Lebanon, this, this means injustice. Why? Because the state itself is founded in its constitution on the idea of the equality of citizens. This is how the state is defined. This is how something called Morocco today is defined. Something called the Arab Republic of Egypt is defined. And therefore, how can you ask some citizens to pay taxes more than others just because their religion is different? given that the state does not take zakah anymore from Muslims, given that these people who pay the non-Muslim tax, they also participate in the army, they also give their lives and their, their money and their children for the sake of the state, which is called Morocco or Egypt, and therefore it is not fair to take this non-Muslim tax or jizya from the Jews of Morocco or the Copts of Egypt. And therefore the hukum itself of the siyasa sharia, that the rule has to change based on the principle. And the ethical principle, which is equality of citizens and justice between them, becomes the hukum here, becomes the fixed rule. And the manifestation of that rule in history becomes a variable. Uh, and, and that is how we as Muslims can contribute to today's politics in an ethical way. If you put justice as the fundamental of the political decision and the policy making here, rather than the linguistic application of the historical narration. Because the linguistic implication of the historical narration is absolutely fine in my ibadat, kind of acts of worship. You know, I have to refer to the Prophet ﷺ for the way I pray, the way I do charity, the way I fast, um, family law, etc. But not in the area of politics, because the area of politics is an area of very fast change of the landscape, of the reality. And as the reality changes, if we do not change the rules, we would defy the fundamental of the rules, which is justice and equality of human beings and, and mercy and common good and all of these. Um, mercy and common good and justice uh, are and wisdom are the fundamentals of the law in general, and especially in the area of politics, 
They have to reign over the details. I'll give you another example other than the jizya in a couple more minutes, which also mentioned in the Quran. The jizya is mentioned in the Quran, but we have to read it in terms of the principle rather than the letter. al ghanim al ghanaim is also mentioned in the Quran, the spoils of war. Um, today, no scholar says that armies in Muslim-majority countries or Muslim countries are supposed to uh, distribute the ghanima in the historical way. Uh, why? Because the distribution in the historical way had certain objectives, had certain maqasid, had certain aims. And the aims was to compensate uh, the, the warriors for their effort and the money they invested in this, and some sort of a, of a salary for them. Uh, so that's why the Prophet ﷺ in the area of Ghana'im was you know, in the area of spoils of war, and when somebody, when, when a soldier kills another soldier in the war, then he takes his uh, stuff for himself. This is now is replaced with a very different um, organization of armies and ranks and salaries and promotions and demotions and all of that, and therefore. If the army today finds cash or finds, I don't know, a tank or weapons, or, they bring it back to the government. They don't take the cash for themselves. Because now, the reality changed. The reality of, uh, of, of politics, of the ground, on the ground changed. And therefore, the policy has to change based on the fundamentals. Um, you, can, you can project that to all areas of political decisions uh, on, on any of the levels uh, of, of politics uh, and, and policy in which the Prophet ﷺ, uh, in his tradition did not mean, did not aim to give us rigid, specific rules on things, but rather to teach us values that we can go by. And therefore, when we make a political decision today, we have to look at the values rather than the letter of the rules. Because the political decisions are not ibadat, are not acts of faith or acts of worship. They are acts of dealings and acts of leadership. And in his leadership, وسلم, he made his ishtihad based on the values rather than based on the scripts. And even when there were scripts, there were scripts that were tied to certain objectives and were not tied to particular ahkam that are supposed to be there in every place and time. Um, this is the, the entry point in this short time that I have. It is an entry point for us uh, to do contemporary ishtihad for new politics in which we are free to change the political structure and to change the, the rules that we inherited in this area into more fair and more ethical political structures and more ethical rules and more ethical policies that deal with the public affairs and the political affairs without um, necessarily uh, limiting ourselves to the historical manifestations of these rules. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, this is our entry point in today's Islam and politics. Uh, today's Islam and politics is politics is that the politics is void of ethics, really. Politicians laugh at you when you talk about ethics. And the way you bring ethics, and we as Muslims to bring Islamic ethics into the area of politics, is to tell them that, well, your political decisions uh, are not uh, totally separate from Islam, as you think. They are separate from our Islamic history, that is correct. But they are not separate from our Islamic values and our Islamic ethics. They have to be at the heart of your political decision. Uh, there is no particular political structure that we have in, in Islam. There is no particular political rule or ahkam that we have. But uh, there is particular political principles that we have to go by. So in this intro to Islamic ethics and politics, I just wanted to highlight a few points. And please uh, let the discussion uh, you know, clarify to you what you find is, is not very clear in, in what I'm saying. And thank you very much. Uh, well, the importance of this topic is actually uh, that 
Sometimes we think about politics without consideration of ethics, and it is very important to bring the ethical dimension to political decision and political science. Um, when we think about Islamic ethics, oftentimes we think about virtues or fada'il without thinking about an implication of politics. We think about personal behavior. So my aim and objective from this lecture was to try to bring politics to the core of political decisions so that our political science students, when they study politics, especially in a modern state, uh, they learn that uh, they have to make their decisions based on ethics, not just based on uh, authority. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you.